Okay, so we're live now. I'm Vanessa. I do podcasts and other things, videos, books, all the like. Today, I'm interviewing Kevin Peterson. He's with me today. He's actually on YouTube as well. He is the founder of Chronic Hope Institute and has a new book coming out about addiction and families. And he also um, has done a lot of work and I've been friends with him for uh, two and a half years now, I think. And so it's been nice having him in my life and being able to visit with him again. He's been on my podcast, Unraveled, twice before. So check out those. I'll actually put the links in the description below if you're listening to this podcast or if you're watching the video. So Kevin, for all the people that don't know who you are or what you do, please take a minute to introduce yourself. Hey, thanks, Vanessa. It's great to see you. Um, my name is Kevin Peterson. I am the author of this book right here, Chronic Hope, Parenting the Addicted Child, um, which came out a year ago. I'm uh, also a licensed marriage and family therapist in the state of Colorado and the state of Florida. And I have an office in Colorado and an office in Florida, and it's under the title of Peterson Family Counseling. The Chronic Hope Institute is the parent company. Um, and there's going to be uh, video trainings for the public and for clinicians coming from that as well, um, based upon working with families in addiction. Uh, let's see, what else is there to tell you? I live in Jacksonville Beach, Florida with my lovely wife and three Boston Terriers. And we, uh, I love living a block from the ocean. We still have a house in Denver and we still have an office in Denver. And I don't know. That's, I mean, for the, for the quick stuff right there, that's who I am. That's what's going on, you know? So I do have a question for you. I'm just curious. Now, I know that you went from Colorado to Florida and that mm -hmm. you still practice in both states, right? You still do yes. that mm -hmm. by telehealth. And so a couple of things I was curious about is since COVID-19 started, how has that changed your work life or has it? Um, are you doing anything differently? And if so, what? And what do you like? kind of perceive the future being? Do you think, you know, how do you think you'll make changes after things settle down? Or do you think that changes you've made are going to be permanent? You know, that's a great question, Vanessa. Um, so what I, well, yeah, I'm still, I still see clients strictly on telehealth in both states. Um, I have seven contractors that work for me in Denver uh, that also see clients on telehealth. And then I have two contractors here in Florida that see clients through telehealth. Um, COVID uh, has been, I mean, ironically, uh, very, very good for me. Um, I had been doing telehealth for two years uh, before uh, on the COVID hit. So it really, it was no, no change for me. It was just kind of like, oh, well, okay. But what's happened is I had an onslaught of business for two reasons. One, I was already prepared to use the telehealth process. Two, the, the, the prototypical group family that I work with is a family that's struggling with a member of the family that's got an addiction problem on some level, and they just don't know what to do with them. Mm -hmm. And before COVID, you know, I mean, whether that person lived in the house or not, they were kind of capable of laying like, well, it's not that big a deal. I don't have to pay attention to it. I can kind of ignore it. But once COVID hit, everybody got trapped in the same house. Mm -hmm. For better and, or worse. Right, exactly. And so what ended up happening is my phone started ringing off the hook. And, and people were like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, what do we do? I had no idea, you know. And so <laughs> things have just been blowing up uh, for, for, for people under 18, for people over 18, people over 65. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of going a little nutty, actually. Business is that good. I was just going to ask, yeah, how has it affected you? Has it been really stressful during the time when, you know, all this wild news is coming out that's really yeah. shocking? And then you're also getting all these people asking for help. I mean, how did, like, how did you feel about that initially? Well, you know, I, uh, I'm... <laughs> I'm a businessman at heart. So I was like, this is great uh, for like the first three months. And then all of a sudden I realized I was overbooking myself. I was overcooked and I was kind of losing my mind. And you also kind of have to remember my, my, my home situation. My wife uh, was diagnosed with colorectal and kidney cancer in April of 2018 and got, got all of it done in January of 2019. But if you know anything about dealing with cancer, just because the cancer has been taken out of you and everything's over, you know, that doesn't mean anything, you know? So yeah. her immune system is completely shot. So we yeah. had to be super, super careful to begin with. And now with this, I mean, she can't leave the house. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I have to take care of a lot, you know, going out of the house, taking care of things. And, and, and I mean, I don't have to take care of her. She's fairly totally capable, 
-hmm. but it's added another layer of stress that I, I can't engage with people because I can't take the chance of bringing something home. I understand. So that's personal. And then professional, yeah, I've had to kind of learn to push back, but that's why I hired more contractors because I have great contractors that I trust implicitly. So I, when people call, I'm like, look, I'm really sorry. I'm booked out till like February, which is the truth. Mm -hmm. But I have these amazing people that I, I suggest you work with and it goes really well. Well, that's great. Mm -hmm. um, so switching gears. So you yeah. author a book called Chronic Hope. Mm -hmm. parent addicted child and that is something that i actually i mean it's really inspiring it's like you're so you're you're different that's for sure you're different from a lot of the clinicians i know i'm serious because right. a lot of the clinicians i know are very mousy you know they're hugely talented a number of clinicians i've known through the years and i respect them mm -hmm. infinitely but they're very mousy and they don't want to talk publicly about their anything that they you know any of the type of work that they do or any um anything at all it's like i don't even know how people will find them honestly because <laughs> they're so hard to like <laughs> they're like so invisible you know what i mean like they don't have a website a lot of people i know so um quite different but it's also inspiring so you know i saw on your new website and stuff and i saw you had a slider and i had like your book on there and you know the one you just showed and you know it just it was really good it was really you know it's just such a good informative um resourceful kind of helpful website the way you present an information and I, that's something i very rarely see in our industry especially in, in a lot of other industries too and mm -hmm. so i actually decided <laughs> i went out on a limb and did it the first time because i had created anger management workbook for my own practice but i was going to put it out publicly for clinicians only because that was what i was going to do then COVID happened and groups in person aren't really a thing anymore so now i'm like reformatting and tweaking a little bit i'm just gonna put it out to the public i'm not like you you just like go out you're just like you just do it <laughs> you're nervous about anything like i'm towards the no, like, that's not me <laughs> I, I know i know it's not you and it's actually very inspiring it's like where do you get all that confidence like you don't ever get nervous or or anything <laughs> what oh is my that God. you're so sweet i mean i i you know i really appreciate you saying that and it's and so, true why I, I, I know and i appreciate that and <laughs> clinically i'll tell you where i so so this is a second career for me right i went back to school in yeah, 2008 graduated in 2011 uh worked in uh, community mental health for three years opened my private practice in 2014. here's the deal mm -hmm. the population that i work with families that are struggling with addiction and codependency, they don't have time for wishy-washy. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't have time for touchy-feely. They don't have time for, you know, the analogy we always use is a family calls and the house is on fire. And, yeah. you know, and then the fire department shows up and they hook up the hoses and they charge up the hoses. And right before they turn the water on, they're like, so, hey, I want to know, what does it feel like to watch your house burn down? You know, and, and what do you think of this? And has this ever happened to you before? And let's talk about what this was like for your experientially. Yeah. And the family's like, turn on the water. Turn on the water. <laughs> turn on the water. You know? And, and I've had enough experiences like that. I think addiction and codependency are kind of different than all the majority of the, the other stuff people come to therapy for. People want an answer and they want it now. And they want to solve the problem now because this person might die. Well, I think there's a, that since I don't know, with my people that I've worked with through the years, whether it be in my company or prior to, there there tends to be a sense of urgency too. It's just because I found that people are contacting, reaching out in a time of crisis. And when I say crisis, I don't mean on this side of a bridge, okay? I'm not talking about that. But I mean, it's a crisis for them in their life in that moment, whatever that may be. Yeah. They're looking for help now, basically. And so I get what you're saying. Well, and but yeah, and and I, and so I've just developed my sense. I mean, I'm also. It's really funny because I can remember like when I was in my twenties, my mom, you know, sort of saying, you know, well, I raised you to speak your mind and and not to hold back and just put your cards on the table, and 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 so that's always how I've been. And <laughs> let me tell you, in corporate America, it doesn't always go over well, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and, anywhere really, probably. Yeah, and in community mental health, it didn't. I mean, I was always this far away from getting fired, and <laughs> and and at the same time, this far away from getting like you know the therapist of the month award, you know, or oh, you know, and, and it was like 
and you know, when I left my, the CEO of the core, the COO of the company was like, you know, you're just not built for this. And he, she said, you're a great therapist and you're really good at what you do, but you are not built for this structure that we have here. And I said, no, I, I agree. And I love you. And thank you for the opportunity for teaching me, but I got to get out. I get it. And, but the, I mean, part of it, okay. So part of it as a therapist is you got to know who you are and what you are, yeah. you know, and what your jam is and what you're good at. And, and cause I think people come to therapy because they want, they have a specific problem in mind that they want to talk about. That may not be the root cause, but that's what they're coming to the table with. And they want to talk about that. And they want to know that you know how to address that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of the opposite of what they taught us in grad school, where the therapist would just sit back passively and go, hmm, how does that make you feel? You know, people come to me and because they want, okay, what do we do? And I, and I say, okay, well, let's triage the problem. We'll solve the problem. We get it fixed. Then it's okay. Now, how do you think this happened? You know? Yeah. And we can start doing more of the traditional therapy stuff, but so it's kind of the reverse, yeah. Yeah, you yeah. know? Um, yeah. So you have a second book coming out that's a follow-up to the first. And so I know your first book, you were telling me, if I remember correctly, and I was reading, that basically your wife had inspired that book, tell, encouraging you basically to share with more people your ideas and methods of how to go about doing things instead of just the people that you're working with in that moment, in that room. Mm -hmm. And so now you have a second book. And so how did this happen? You know, the second book, because you just published the first one back in 2019. It's done really well. I mean, it's got a lot of traction and stuff. And then I mean, you obviously are also putting it, making it very visible so it's seen, which, I mean, bravo to you for that, for like having the confidence to really put your work out there. Because that's really, you know, it's a hard place to be in, you know, because you're putting yourself out there. And, you, you know, when you put yourself out there, you don't know what you're going to get all back all the time, you know. So you've got the second one coming. And so how'd that happen? Uh, you know, after I finished the first one, actually, while I was writing the first one, it, you know, it's chronic hope, parenting the addicted child. It really is sort of a, a like a how-to guide to deal with the, someone who's 18 or under. Although, mm -hmm. let's be clear, children can be 26, 36, 46, 66. Mm -hmm. But but that 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 was really kind of a how-to. And my buddy Keith Bradley, who's an interventionist uh, and who's an amazing interventionist um, uh, that I work with uh, regularly, said, "Hey, I love your book. Only one problem." Every person I'm going to hand this to is going to say, my kid's not 16, they're 40. And, and, I, and he goes, I know it's the same plan. And anyone in our business knows it's the same plan. But when you have a family that's in total panic and crisis, they, they, they're they going to read that and be like, this won't help me. You know, mm -hmm. so. So, so was but, the first one framed like kind of mark, like aimed at like more youth oriented addiction? Yeah, well, parents. For parents. parents yeah. Yeah. This okay. one, and this one sort of picks up where that leaves off. It's not a rewrite. It, it's, okay. it's here's the established plan. The plan sort of stays the same, but it gets more in depth into how do we heal the family? You know, mm -hmm. because the family system is part of what created the addict. So, and I, I want to be clear, it's not the addict, it's not the family's fault. You know, mm -hmm. um, but how they react to it and how they address it and how they address their own wounds and their own trauma that is their responsibility. And mm -hmm. so I want to help the family understand that just putting somebody into treatment doesn't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a great no, beginning. It doesn't because people have to make choices once they come out to follow up and do what they need to do and always possible. And that's mm -hmm. a big commitment for people. And it's a whole change of life. You know, my, <laughs> I'm embarrassed to admit this, but so I watched some of the dumbest stuff on TV to kind of check out, honestly. And my, one of my really embarrassing shows I watch, which if anyone falls me on they don't talk about is love after lockup. Have you heard of this show? <laughs> Have you heard of this show? I, I have. I'm a below. I'm a below deck guy myself. So we're on the same team, okay? <laughs> Low brow reality TV. But anyways, um, one of the scenes I just saw when I was today, actually, my husband had it on, kind of just in the background, was someone who had just gotten out of prison, and they were literally. There was actually a couple of different scenes like this, a couple of different people, and they literally were returning 
right back into the community with the exact same people that they're hanging out with right before they went in. And I was just like, this doesn't, you know, and I don't even, I even have to study it that much, but I have watched all the episodes now to know this doesn't look like a really great idea. You know what I mean? But it's the same thing with the drug users. You know, it's like, you have to really have a whole lifestyle change, just like losing weight. You got to have a whole lifestyle change. You can't just do the crash diet and, you know, think it's going to be forever. So, it's hard for people. Well, and and quite honestly, let's be clear and let's be totally blunt. The people that you're talking about, um, probably the overall majority have issues with drugs and alcohol. You know, I'm not sure of these two characters. I can't remember. Yeah, I, the the pod, the prison, the population we're talking about. But I use that analogy a lot with the families that I work with. I'm like, you know, here's the thing: when we bring somebody home from 90 days in treatment, they're coming out of a super structured environment where yeah. everything is handled and taken care of and there's a schedule. Just you like Karen, evidently. Yeah, right, that's, right. What yeah. that's what they say in Love After Lockup, jail and prisons like this. <laughs> and so when you bring them home and you just set them free and you wonder why they just immediately gravitate back to trouble, it's like, no, 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 no. you can't do that. You have to support them. And I don't mean financially. I mean, you got to give them structure. You got to give them engagement, you know, school, work, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, mm -hmm. you got to, the, you know, what is the idle hands of the devil's workshop? You, you got to get yeah. them cooking, you know, yeah, and, yeah. you know, I, that's to me is the critical piece. That's why, you know, like when I watch love after lockup, which I've watched, you know, <laughs> as, a family therapist, as a couples therapist, what am I, my, what I would be, what I would want is to get after those people while the person is still in lockup and get after them and the families and say, Hey, let's talk about how things are going to be different when they come back. Yeah. Yeah. That's the work I really do. That's my real love is getting in with that family and saying, you know, so-and-so is a treatment and they've been gone 30, 60, 90, six months or a year. And now how are we going to change the family system? Mm -hmm. You know, cause yeah. So for people who want to learn more about the work that you do and the book that's coming out and just basically all these different things, I mean, how would they find out about reaching you or learning more about your written work? Or I know that you've been on YouTube a lot, you've been doing interviews with people mm -hmm. that run treatment facilities. I saw in some cases and yeah. are licensed clinicians and things like that. How would people find out about that? So I have a YouTube channel called the Chronic Hope Institute, uh, which I think you would put down there um, and you can subscribe to there. And that's where like all the announcements and all the stuff will go. I have a, a Facebook page for the Chronic Hope Institute. I have the Peterson Family Counseling Facebook page um, and you can subscribe to all those. And I have a monthly newsletter as well that you can subscribe to um, on Gosh, I think you go onto the uh, Facebook page, the Peterson Family Counseling, and and I think you just hit like uh, send me contact information, and I'll I'll make sure you get on the list. And yeah, that's that's how you get it. And you can always call me. You can always email me. You can always text me directly. I always have time to answer questions. So I will put um, all of your relevant contact information down below, specifically your Chronic Hope Institute website, YouTube channel. And then the link to your current book that you have available. And then I'm sure if people decide to keep up with you on this subscribe newsletter, I'm sure you'll release that about when it's released. So yep. hoping the goal is to have it done and ready to rock by the end of the year. Okay. So December, you think that's right next month. This is November. Oh yeah. Right. Well, the goal. <laughs> <laughs> the goal. I like that registered. I'm like, oh, it's November. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Today is my. I have to get a little shout out here. Today, November 9th, is my amazing, incredible uh, younger sister's birthday, Susie, Susie Peterson Wyman, who lives in Steamboat Springs, Colorado. Um, well, let's just say she's younger than I am, and we won't we won't <laughs> put any numbers out there. But she and her husband and her, my nieces live out there. And happy birthday! I love you. You're the best. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you for being on today, Kevin. I greatly appreciate it. And everyone, if you're listening to the podcast, check the description below for more info. If you are watching the video, you can do the same. Look below in the description. I hope you all have a great day. Bye. Thanks.